For over a decade, Kim and I have been compelled to explore the far corners of Alaska by fat bike. As winter settles in, rivers, bays, and lakes freeze, snow falls, and the mostly roadless state opens to travel and migration. Friends and distant family are visited. Hunting parties head to ancient hunting grounds for caribou, moose, sea mammals, and other traditional foods. And a variety of racing events bring people out into the winter world. Learning to navigate these snow trails at human speed has opened our eyes to countless wonders of this magical place. For thousands of years, Alaska's indigenous peoples relished in winter and understood its rules and temperament. Winter, however, is not the only season for long and remote fat bike trips. Certain regions of Alaska are better approached in milder seasons. And no area is more temperamental than the high Arctic. In 2017, Kim and I accomplished a summer route entirely above the Arctic Circle, from Tikigak to Utqiagvik, the northernmost community in the United States. The expedition was challenging, but deeply rewarding. We were overjoyed to discover that most of the route was actually bikeable. Our appetite for summer Arctic expeditions had been wet, and we soon conceived of a new fat bike and pack raft trip. This time, we would begin in Kotzebue and end in Tikigak. The completion of this trip would link a series of routes we have done that stretch from further south than our home in Homer to the very tippy top of Alaska. The second half of this trip that we're doing is fulfilling that that segment of beach that we have yet to fat bike and, and complete that long route. So this trip that we're on is about 200 miles, but there's really only about the last 80 miles of it that we have to complete in order to have our route be all the way contiguous from South Alaska to the tippy top north of Alaska. As soon as we got going, it hammered us with the strongest winds of the day for a few hours. And as soon as we landed, got calm again. Had to cut way into the no attack delta to get over here. And having that big body of challenging water with current and potential for really high winds 
having that behind us now is a huge relief and we put in a big first day and today we get to ride the beach in. Unless there's some real super unexpected thing that was the most paddling we'll have to do on this trip. Cranes, geese, swans, ducks, tons of kinds of little shorebirds and gulls and it's just there's bird life surrounding us at all times and so it's very nice. Yesterday was just pure fat biking bliss. Compact beaches for miles. We didn't even have to blow the rafts up once. Not once. Didn't get my feet wet. Didn't even get our feet wet. I mean, you just, and the weather has been just incredible. You know, as soon as we hit the beach, we're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome riding. We were worried that it was gonna be like soft pea gravel and real grindy. And I'm not even worried, yeah. just kind of like expecting it and like head down, like, hey, this is what it's gonna be. Yeah. But we hit the beach and it was this beautiful, compacted, mixed grain size, so everything, you know, it was fast and good. But <clears throat> not, you know, five minutes into the ride. I found Boboom a mammoth tooth. Near the end of the day when we were thinking, okay, you know, it's time to start looking for a place to camp. Almost everywhere we've been, it's like beautiful campsites, level areas, lots of driftwood for fire. Water is a little bit sparse, so we did stop at one creek and refill. But we were kind of like, at the point in the day, we were like, okay, it's time to start looking around for a place to camp, and we came um, up upon a herd of at least 15, maybe more, muskox um, grazing in the meadow. Last night we stopped and filmed them, photographed them, and then this morning when we were getting going, some stragglers were wandering right next to camp. And just all the bird life here. Just Insane so, bird life, just yeah. everywhere. And so this area, Cape Cruz and Cern, is known for some of the oldest archeological sites, you know, that have been discovered in Alaska. So we're at this pretty shitty shelter cabin that we stayed in three and a half years ago when we passed through here on a winter trip trying to bike all the way from Nome to Point Hope. We must have left some food here because here's two bags of food that's totally recognizable as ours, including this cheddar broccoli soup, which I plan to eat tonight. Yesterday was another one of these just incredible days. I was thinking about it earlier the Arctic explorer Phil Homer Stephenson has a book that's titled uh, The Friendly Arctic. And you know, that's kind of like thought of as a little bit oxymoronic, but you know, Kim and I have now done a lot of trips in the Arctic and we've seen a huge array of moods. But on this trip so far, friendly is the adjective that you know really comes to mind. The, the issue has been overheating, you know, not being too cold. And we have had basically no bugs. You know, there's no bugs and there's no wind. So when we were in the Arctic for the summer trip uh, two years ago, we didn't have a problem with bugs, but that was really because it was windy all the time. But this trip has really been calm and no bugs. So the whole trip, we've been documenting seabird mortalities uh, as part of a coast a seabird monitoring. And um, basically what we do is ride along the beach and as we see a dead seabird, um, we, you know, I take out the little camera that I have that has a GPS locator in it. So you take the uh, snapshot of the picture of it, it records um, where it is. We have been seeing incredible amounts. Yeah, we might be almost 100 total on our whole trip so far. So um, it's pretty sad to see um, 
that's all. It, it appears to me like, oh, this is an episode, like this is a, a die off. And this summer it's been 15, upwards of 15 degrees warmer water than normal. This just has a cascade of a, you know, effects and this is bound to be related to the warming water. I can say almost certainly that it's related to climate change. On this route, I mean, the evidence of climate change is surrounding us. Coastal erosion occurring on the bluffs, so sea level rise, melting permafrost, these seabird die-offs. We're going to pass through Kivalina, and this is a village that is in imminent need of relocation due to sea level rise. It's, of course, the Arctic, where, you know, it's kind of like out there. And yet, these, these things that are happening because of our continued reliance on fossil fuels is affecting these far, far corners. It's awe-inspiring to see what an intact habitat can sustain in terms of life and diversity. And, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we could live in a world where there aren't nearly as many birds and it's not something that I'm, it's not a reality that I'm like, feel ready to face. Southwesterly, so it's blowing in off of the ocean and it's creating, generating a lot of big waves. I don't think this is the friendly Arctic anymore. The interesting thing that happens here is because it's so shallow, when it blows um, across the water like that, it drives the water up the beach um, and you can even have flooding events. This afternoon's supposed to be the worst of it and it's supposed to be kind of coming down over the course of the next couple of days. We've come like five miles out of Kivalina. <laughs> Kivalina is one of the 31 recognized villages that have to be relocated due to, you know, global warming. And, you know, being here during a storm is just so apparent why. They, they're building, uh, you know, putting up riprap all around the village. But when these storms come in, they, uh, they, they just inundate the village. And if they didn't have the big rocks that they're putting up now, it would have already been eroded away. Yeah, it's pretty wild to be here when a storm is happening. You just see how vulnerable you know that place is. So we've made it to Chariot, which is famous because it's near Cape Thompson. It's the valley before Cape Thompson, which is our next crux. But it's famous because after World War II, this guy from the Atomic Energy Agency, William Teller, had this crazy idea that you could use nuclear bombs to build harbors and he proposed to do his uh, demonstration project here. From their perspective, you know, it's a remote, wild, nowhere place, but there are villages on both ends of us, There's, but in Point Hope is especially, it's close, and this is where they come on caribou, and we're coming to just like nuke it. This Not place to, almost got nuked. Yeah, this place literally like, almost, almost got, got nuked. <laughs> was gonna, they were gonna turn this into a massive harbor just to demonstrate how they could do it. It's a crazy, crazy thing, and thankfully the people from Point Hope and you know some uh, cooler heads prevailed. Uh, yeah, it's this really incredible, beautiful place. Really, it's been on my list of places to come see for many years. 
we put the hammer to it to get here to Cape Thompson or to the approach to Cape Thompson. So Cape Thompson also has uh, seabird rookeries on it, which would be really exciting to see from the water. I've been continuing to do seabird mortality surveys as we've been biking along. I've been just riding along and it has been a task, but I'm doing it because I think it's gonna be valuable information to have. Sometimes it's a little de depressing. Seeing all the seabird, the dead seabirds, is like pretty striking. And then the other thing is the marine debris. You know, there's so much fucking trash. And it's of, you know, at least three countries that we're seeing. You know, there's like a lot of Korean trash, Russian trash, and American trash. Okay, it's a piece of trash, not a dead bird. I'd rather it be a piece of trash than a dead bird because... At least that... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's sad. Yeah. It's like the two together are kind of like a, a one-two punch, you know? Like, yeah. That sucks. And it doesn't feel like this area is like dying necessarily. You know, there is a lot of vitality here, a lot of bird species that are doing well, and marine mammals that are doing well. But you know, definitely, there is a, a sickness. You know, that is a, infecting the army. I know of three people that have done this trip, and I'm sure that there are more. But it's still very rarely done you know what, what we're doing right now and man you know on a fat bike or you know if you were just yeah. walking with a pack raft either way yeah. you know biking with a pack raft or walking with a pack raft this has been such a, an agreeable route you know it's so doable and so cool so i built this uh, driftwood fortification without the help of any strategy or forethought whatsoever. <laughs> Let's do the wide tour. Why don't you show yeah, us around? It's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> okay, so what do we got over here? Okay, so um, basically what we're doing is uh, Bar barricading ourselves against the north wind that's uh, in the forecast. Today, it's supposed to rip out of the north, and we have seen north arctic winds before on coastlines, and they're terrifying. We really want to paddle around the cape, so we've kind of opted to make this camp and wait, wait out the weather in the hopes that we get a calm opportunity to paddle around. This st structure is designed to help barricade us from the strong north wind. It was like 7.30 last night, we, we finally launched and we were able to paddle from the from Chariot all the way around all of the series of sheer capes to this first beach now, which is a continuous beach all the way to Point Hope, which is about 23 miles away. After waiting several days for that offshore wind to finally calm down, we put in last evening at Crowbill Point and there was still a little bit of wind, but the water was flat and instantly come around the corner to just this spectacular scene of thousands of seabirds. Like maybe millions. Millions of seabirds like whirling around overhead, nesting on the cliffs, diving off. The rock structures were incredibly stunning and steep. Right off the bat, there was this sea arch that we got to paddle underneath. And then it was six miles of the most dramatic seascape you can imagine. It was kind of difficult to take in the spectacle because we were having to paddle pretty hard and, and then also just, it was so high overhead. You get distracted. 
it's impossible to kind of take it all in because you know you're like your eyes are looking at this big flock ball swirling this way but meanwhile there's still a bunch of other stuff going on here there but like being in like beijing or something you know some city where you can't right you, you know you're like oh there's a lot of yeah this organism doing its thing you know <laughs> We'd look yeah. up at the cliff and the rocks are so complex that sometimes it's just hard to tell what is a bird and what isn't. And it's almost like the entire rock was alive. We're really fortunate to have had calm enough conditions to be able to paddle, but we really did have to kind of keep our heads down. We were only making like one and a half miles an hour. Anytime Bjorn took out the camera, we lose a lot of ground. Yeah, I was impressed with the current. I wasn't really expecting to see that current. Probably the coolest thing I've ever seen in yeah, my life, uh, honestly. I, I put it up there with, you know, there's like yeah. maybe two other things I can think of that are like comparable. But this has become, in my mind, one of the absolute preeminent fat bike pack raft trips that we've ever done for so many reasons. And, you know, these like, this being the kind of the cherry on top is absolutely, you know, it, it just, it's a complete package. This was the climax to an already amazing little expedition. Yeah. Moving at human speed while carrying all of life's necessities is a tradition as old as our species. We are exquisitely adapted to explore, to roam, to use our bodies. Periodically unshackling from the chains of civilization and engaging in the act of migration is the practice we employ that allows us to reconnect with our innate nature. Traversing vast landscapes is to be an observer of the rapid changes to our natural and cultural world. In the face of climate disruption and the emergence of the epoch known as the Anthropocene, habitat degradation, species extinction, and the oblivion of cultural ways of knowing come into sharp focus the more we slow down and pay attention to the interconnected web of life. Like mountaineers reaching a summit, Kim and I feel a tremendous sense of accomplishment whenever we reach our predetermined destination. Unlike a cold mountaintop engulfed in a lonely atmosphere, however, these destinations are part of a vast network that, when taken as a whole, represents something much larger than a dot on the globe or an isolated end goal. The pre-trip abstraction of a map or a satellite image becomes something tangible, real, familiar. An ever-expanding appreciation for this great land known as Alaska, is our reward. We return home with an invigorated sense of connection and purpose, inspired to unlock the next secret.